Hello, how are you this morning? All of you, <laughs> good. <laughs> My name is Donnie Clinton. I'm the intern at Rooftop Church. I oversee the high school and young adult ministry, the other two joys that God has given my heart. Woo! I don't know. Woo! Yeah. And that's enough about me this morning. We have a lot to get into, so let's pray. Father, we admit that we have sinned against you and what we have done and what we've left undone. In our hearts, we turn people away who need your grace, and sometimes we forget about how dear your love is. This morning, I pray you remind us of that, and as we dive into your word, I pray that you would humble us, because we are desperately in need of being humbled. Our sin makes us arrogant. I pray this morning that we would see Jesus in the scriptures and that you would stir our affections to follow him all the more. Thank you so much for your son and his life and his death and his resurrection. We're so grateful. It's in his holy name we pray, amen. Let me tell you about a great man, a philosopher, a genius somebody who changed the world, someone we all look up to in some way or another, I'm sure, someone we can't help to think about. His name is Tupac. (laughs) Tupac Shakur. (laughs) Tupac Shakur is arguably one of the greatest rappers in history. There's Africa Bambada, Eazy-E. They're all great, but Tupac runs in front of them all, I think, And in 1996, Tupac wrote a song called Only God Can Judge Me. And in this song, he uh, details his life and time in gangs, his uh, fear of being shot when he goes outside, his friends who are in the hospital because of their involvement in gang activity. It really is, if you know the background, a really, really moving song. And after every chorus, there's a line that comes in and repeats uh, four, five, six times, it's, Only God can judge me. Only God can judge me. And while Tupac writes, only God can judge me, what he's really getting at and saying is that where I come from and the things that I have experienced, I do not warrant the judgment of God. He says that my difficult life and the things that I have been through, those things are judgment enough. So God's judgment is invalid. And I want to be honest with you. I'm unsure if Tupac is really mindful of God. Um, I really, if we were honest about his life, he practiced some evil things and was involved in shootings and uh, gang violence. And as inspirational as the dude was to do what he did in just like four years, make a big career, And as tragic as it is that he died at 25, his life does not demonstrate the kind of life that we would look to to somebody who fears God. Now, I want to be honest. I I don't know the guy. I don't know him at all. And he he might be this incredible God-free man. I didn't know him personally. But even to suggest that he can't be judged or held accountable is an affront to what God tells his people to do. So to discount himself in that is to say, I do not need this part of you, God. And I really don't think Tupac would like what we have to say this morning or what Paul writes in Romans chapter 2. Because in Romans 2, 5 through 11, Paul is clarifying that the wrath and grace of God will fall on those who it will fall on because everybody is going to be judged by God. Now, Paul is writing to the Jewish audience who don't think that they're going to be judged, and that's where we kind of find ourselves this morning. Today, we're continuing this huge extended study in the book of Romans, and we're in our second part called Face the Wrath. Now, the book of Romans, if you don't know, is a New Testament letter. It's the New Testament, the second half of the Bible after the Old Testament. It's written to a church in a large city called Rome, and Rome has incredible political and religious influence. So, obviously, there's a huge church there, people who believe in Jesus Christ. 
filled with people who want to know and honor Jesus. So Paul, just like in any of his other letters, is writing to these churches to try and establish and help them understand this is how you live and follow Jesus. Proper thought and proper action. Paul's also writing to Rome because while there were many, many faithful people in Rome, there were also people who were hypocrites. People who intentionally went out of their way to sin. Not normal sinning, intentional, high-handed sinning, who didn't obey truth, whose hearts didn't feel shame, and they're muddying the waters for the other believers. And Paul, as you can imagine, is not very happy about that. And today we'll be discussing Romans 2, 5 through 11, so you are welcome to turn with me there if you have a Bible or get out a Bible app. If you don't have a Bible, you can talk to one of the staff. We'd love to give you one, but all of the words, they're going to be up on the screen. It's in the English Standard Version if you'd like to follow along with me. So let's read. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. Now, this is before Paul is writing to this big Jewish and non Jewish audience. There are also some of these people called Christian Gentiles there. Now, a Christian Gentile is someone who wasn't raised Jewish, who has come to the faith and now believes in Jesus Christ. In this audience, there are some Jews who are saying, well, I'm not going to be judged because of my history in being an Israelite. We're kind of in the exact same context we were last week. The only difference is that Paul is getting much more specific about who's going to be judged and how they're going to be judged. In Romans 2, 5 through 11, is just Paul clarifying something he said before. And I actually kind of sympathize with this Jewish audience because if you just have read the Old Testament or even just gone to vacation Bible school when you were growing up, you know that the story of Israel is is really, really rocky. And that they were enslaved by Egypt and towards the end of that 400-year enslavement, they were basically had their children taken away from them and killed. that's That's a terrible, terrible, terrible offense. And Then also, after they escaped from Egypt by God's gracious power, they had to wander the desert for 40 years because of the arrogance that they found in their hearts. But then, after that, as we go further down the line, we find that the Israelites are now being taken into exile by Babylon. The history of Israel is rocky. So for them to say, like, well, we don't deserve judgment, it's like, well, yeah, I can see why you would say that thing. That makes a lot of sense to me. The audience is kind of like Tupac when they say, only God can judge me. What they're really saying is, I don't want judgment from anybody. And I want to be explicit. This this sin we're dealing with this morning in the audience in Rome, it's the sin of arrogance. And I'm guilty of that too. And you are guilty of that too. If I, yeah. We all do things. When we sin against God, it's arrogant. We think our way is better when we go to appease our own flesh. We think our way is better. I can't even, like, count the times where I was like, oh, God will forgive me of this. And just like Paul's audience, you and I are arrogant. But also, nobody will get away from the judgment of God because they're Jewish. And you and I won't escape that judgment either. And that's what Paul is reminding us of this morning. God is going to judge everyone, even those who think they don't deserve it. Because as Paul reminds us in verse 11, that God shows no partiality. In God, there is no partiality. The story of the Jewish people isn't swaying God's vote against the judgment that he's going to reveal on the day of wrath. Paul is telling his audience that they will, and 
subsequently telling us that we will be judged, and we're going to be judged based on how we live our lives. Those things will help to determine your judgment. Romans 2, 6-9 says, He will render each according to his works to those who by patience and while doing for glory and honor and immortality, seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey truth but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. And now as you hear that, I, I'm, you're probably thinking, if this is the first time you've heard it, you might be thinking the same thing uh, that I saw. Like, well, now I have to go and be nice to people that I disagree with because Donnie is saying that salvation comes from your works. That might be where you're at. That's where I was at the first time I read it. Nope, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what Paul is saying. It's not like, well, Donnie said my salvation comes from good works, so i got to go volunteer at the local nursing home to get enough gold stars to sit in the front row when Jesus comes back on his pony. (laughs) When we come to these types of texts, we have to ask certain questions about it so we can understand what's happening. We, in any text of the Bible, shouldn't just assume something is being said. We need to dig into it. When I read Romans 2, 5 through 11, my first time in Bible college in my Romans class, I thought, wow, I'm going to be judged based on my works, and I'm pretty lazy. And is Paul saying that I'm saved by my works? Well, no. I had to ask two questions when I came to this text. It's, what isn't Paul saying here? And what is Paul saying here? I'm going to tackle both of those, but we're going to start with the first one. Paul is not saying that our works save us. Nowhere in our text this morning does Paul say that we get our salvation from the works that we do. And we cannot presume or think that the text is saying that. The language of judgment and the language of salvation are both deeply theological words. And when they come up in scripture, we have to understand them in the, in the text that they're in, in the book that they're in and also where they're at in the Bible. Paul absolutely believes that you and I are saved by grace. But those things that you do, those works that he's talking about in this text, those works help to point back to the proof of your salvation. Those things that have changed your heart, your works are what flow out of you when Jesus changes your heart. Saved people do good works because God has changed their heart. That simple, period, paragraph. In the book of Ephesians, Paul writes that we're saved by grace. If works have saved us, then one person might be more saved than another, and that's not how it works at all. We're totally and completely saved by the works of Jesus Christ and his grace and his death and resurrection. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no man can boast. Paul believes that salvation comes from Christ alone, so we cannot say that Paul is saying our salvation comes from works. This works to prove that. As we'll see later in, in Romans, Paul believed that we're saved by grace and grace alone. And I'm excited to get there later. But that leads us into our next question. What is Paul saying here? Paul is saying that the works of your life reveal that you have been saved by grace. The works that you do are kind of a proof that you've been saved. They're not salvation themselves. They merely point back to the reality that God has redeemed you. Faith and works have a really close relationship to one another, and you can't have one without the other. James 2, 14 through 18 says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and well filled, without giving them the things they need for their body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. 
Paul is mentioning now what James goes on to mention later in the Bible. When you begin to believe in God, your heart changes. And your works are an evidence of that change. It's like when you met your significant other or really just a good friend, just someone you really love. Their presence in your life and the effect that had on your heart is now poured out in the deeds and actions you take and do to honor that person. That for husband, maybe writing a note to your significant other or, or buying her flowers or taking out the trash. Those are things that you do to honor your, your significant other so, because your heart has been changed with their presence in your life. And we're talking about the same thing this morning. Your heart has been changed so you do good works for the kingdom. 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ controls us. And just like you're compelled to serve the person that you love, we're controlled by the love of Christ. The affections that we feel for Jesus determine how we live our lives and how our lives, they show that God has changed our hearts. God has changed our hearts and now it shows how we belong to him when we go and do good works. I'm getting caught up. Refocus. We're controlled because we make decisions based on Christ's love for us and the love that we feel for him. We're controlled by Christ's love because we get to reflect on it to better see how we're supposed to go about honoring our neighbors. We're not robots or puppets. We're not mindless golems or none of that. We are companions and friends, brothers, sisters, saved because of his love. And because of Jesus' great love, we must respond. That's what Paul is getting at in this text this morning. And as I looked over and like, what can I say to my family at Rooftop? These are the three things that I humbly offer for your consideration, and maybe God will show you something in one of these application points I have for you this morning. But the first one is, pray for God to change your heart. Romans 2, 5 through 6 says, but because of your heart and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. The sins that we indulge in make us calloused. They remove us from the presence of God because God can't be near sin. The more we sin, the further we get away from him. And God must go in and change our hearts. God must do the decisive, miraculous heart transplant, heart replacement work. Only God can do that. And Paul writes that a hard heart will keep us from knowing and loving the compassion of God. I have a story. When my grandmother passed away, I wanted to talk to my dad about Jesus. C.S. Lewis says that suffering is God's megaphone to a sleeping world, and I thought maybe this will be the thing that convinces my dad to look towards the cross. We were sitting one day at our dinner table and talking about God and Jesus and who he is and what he's doing, and my dad said, yeah, I'm excited to go see grandma in heaven. But if you don't know any of my story, my dad is just this drug dealer guy. He actually just got two Mondays, three Mondays ago, got sentenced to three more years in prison because of his activity with drugs. He has not let up since I was a child. And I told him, not with that tone, I told him, Dad, Jesus wants you to follow him, absolutely, and he wants you to go to heaven, but those things have to come out in your life. You can't keep dealing drugs and doing dope. Those aren't things that you can do, man. And he took a beat and he said... I guess I'll just go to hell then. My dad's heart is so hard that he'd rather embrace hell than know the compassion of God, and that breaks my heart. He did, did not want to soften his heart to turn and embrace Jesus. My father is an arrogant man, and this example is the definition of an impenitent and hard heart. He feels no shame and I care about his deeds, and I pray every day that God would change it. And we must pray for our hearts to change too, to break off the calluses we're forming because sometimes we get bored of our God or the things, the time where we doubt him when we don't feel his love. We pray for God to change our heart because God is the decisive heart changer. But I have to tell you that your and I's actions are required in that process. So I encourage you to pray for God to change your heart, to break off the calluses and the 
the scars and the pains that you heal because God is in the business of changing hearts. Ezekiel 36, 26 through 28 says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statute and be careful to keep my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. God is telling Israel that his work will redeem them. They will feel his closeness and be able to walk in his statutes and keep his commandments all from the redemption of their hearts. And I don't know where anybody is at this morning, but I pray two things. One, if your heart is getting hard, go desperate before the Lord that he would change it, and he will because he's faithful. But if you're far off and don't know Jesus, I pray desperately that you would pray to know him and know God and know the redemption that you can feel in embracing the cross of Jesus Christ. And maybe you think you're too far off. Nonsense. An infinite God went to the cross to die for you. There is no sin you can commit against him that he would not forgive you of. Don't let the devil keep you in secret places of your own shame. Reach out if you need help. Know somebody. Don't let your heart stay callous. Pray for God to change your heart and he can do it. My second point. Stop doing evil things. Romans 2.8. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey truth, but obey unrighteousness, they, there will be wrath and fury. Just like in our passage, if we are self-seeking in denial of truth and we obey unrighteousness, we become calloused and cold to the depths of our sinfulness and our depravity. We begin to believe we will not feel the judgment of God. We recite lyrics like, only God can judge me, meaning that no one can offer judgment in our life. And But we must, as Christians, learn to hate the evil things that we do. And when I say evil things, I mean sin. Make no mistake about it. If you have any conception of sin that it is an absolutely destructive and evil and brings death to everybody in this world, then you have the wrong definition. Sin is terrible and it is evil and an affront to God. And we must become more convinced of God's glory and his majesty and his beauty and observe how incredible he is to put our sin to death. When we go searching to satisfy our own sinful nature, it's like a child who's looking to drink poison. We must learn to control the evil things in our life. It's kind of like in the movie, How to Train Your Dragon. When, <laughs> when Hiccup first meets Toothless, he had every intention to kill this dragon and honor his father. That's what he said. I'm going to honor my father. I'm going to take out your heart. I'm going to give it to my dad. But instead of deciding to kill Toothless, he lets the dragon Go, and then Toothless roars and leaps at Hiccup and puts his back against a rock, and his claw is right on his neck, and he has every intention to kill him. The only difference between our sin and Toothless is that our sin doesn't back down. It's there. It's waiting to hurt you. The Bible is not, saying, is not lying when it says that sin is crouching at your door. It's in the places you call home. When the Bible speaks of sin, it's not doing so in jest or that seriousness or like it's nothing to worry about. Sin is cancer and sickness and death. And anyone who's lost someone in their life can attest to the sorrow they feel because of the sin's effects on us. When people die it's because of sin, sin is an injury to our greatest lover, a betrayal of our truest friend, dishonoring of our heavenly father, an act of war against a mighty king, the creature spitting towards the creator. Indulgence in sin is the denial of a savior that died for us. Sin is not a pet to be walked several times a week. It is a lion, a wolf, or a bear, and it bites and hunts at will. It attacks as a piranha. Our sin is relentless. It cannot be trained or bridled or domesticated. It cannot be rescued, rehabilitated, or redeemed. 
Sin will never wear a collar or stick to a kennel or cease clawing at your throat. That's sin. Sin is not a pet we walk. We must kill our sin, struggling to be holy, observing God's word in prayer and in congregational worship, working towards his holiness. We do not walk our sin like a pet because our sin is a tiger that hates us. My final point, obey God. Romans 2, 10 through, uh, Romans 2, 10 says, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Greek. I believe with all of my heart that we are saved by grace alone. But as people who follow Jesus, we are asked to do good works. We find out what those works are when we open our Bibles, when we ask God for guidance, when we're plugged into a local congregation, and we see what does this church need and how can I do it, even if you're not that good at it. Obedience is not a dirty word for the gospel-centered Christian. We're saved from the wrath of God by a sovereign grace, but that grace pushes us into active, holy lives. Our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, has redeemed us from our lawlessness to purify for himself a people of his own possession. The Bible says that the children of God are the ones who practice righteousness. You and I are creatures called to worship, made innocent by Christ's blood, who do good work for the sake of our Father and the kingdom. I mean, consider that the first man ever created was a gardener, and that's the holy thing God gave him to do to honor him. And the question this morning is, what good things can you be doing? Are you volunteering in a ministry that needs help? Are you uh, giving to the church? When Jesus calls a man, he asks him to come, and then when he gets there and follows Jesus, there are good works for him to do. Husbands, are you getting home at the end of long, tired days and making sure to check on your wife's heart? Ladies, are you doing the same as you get home at the end of long days? Are you checking on your kid's heart? Are you checking on your husband's heart? Mothers and fathers, people who work with teenagers, are you actively making sure that you are pushing the people in your life that you have so much influence over towards the cross? Who are you discipling? Who are you being discipled by? What good works can you do? Are you praying with your children and reading scripture in your house? There is a long list of incredible kingdom things you can do that take no time at all, but will mean the world later. And those works are an outpouring of the good works that Jesus has done for us in redeeming us and dying on the cross. We can do nothing aside from the power of Jesus Christ. And just like the Jewish audience in our text, well, we also will be judged based on our work. So we must turn to Christ and his saving grace in order that our hearts will change and we will follow him. I want you to know that if you're far off this morning and you're considering following Jesus, that grace is readily available for you. And every moment after this too. When you say, I want to follow Jesus, that's the Holy Spirit coming into your life and waking up your dead heart. Only by the Holy Spirit can anyone say that Christ is Lord. This morning you can experience peace that Jesus offers to those who believe in him and love him. Let's pray.